Joining us now from Baltimore, Dr. Tom Inglesby, Director of the Center for Health Security at Johns Hopkins University. Doctor, I know you watched the rally last night from a public health standpoint, if not a political one. I guess the good news was there wasn't as big a crowd as expected, but as an epidemiologist watching that rally last night, what did you see? Yeah, I, I thought that the rally was concerning in terms of public health risk. I think CDC's recent guidance was that uh, the highest risk gatherings are those that are large indoors, where people can't stay apart from each other more than six feet, and where people travel from out of town. And this rally met all of those criteria. And what I saw was that people were sitting quite close to each other, didn't see very many people wearing masks. There were some people handshaking without hand sanitizer, lots of shouting. All of those things will increase the risk of spread. Given all of that, does the president's rally in Tulsa have the potential to be a super spreader of the virus? We have seen in the past few months around the world that indoor gatherings have been the source of most super spreading events. And those are events where one person can give, it to, give the virus to many people. So there's an opportunity for much more spread in a short period of time. So I am worried about that. I know that many people in the public health community are worried about the potential for a big spreading event. I want to pick up on that because a number of conservatives point out that a lot of the media and even some public health experts, not you, but some of your colleagues, didn't express the same concerns when there were tens of thousands of people taking to the streets in protests over the death of George Floyd, many of them not wearing masks. Is, is there some hypocrisy where public health concerns depend upon the politics of the gathering that's being held? Well, they, they shouldn't depend on the gathering that's being held. I think the public health principles are the same, uh, whether it's for one purpose or another. I certainly sympathize with the motivations of the, the demonstrations that have gone on across the country, but I do worry that they are an opportunity for spread. I think it's a little bit, it, or even a, more than a little bit different than having a large indoor gathering. We know that outdoor risks are less than indoor risks, and uh, if people can maintain their space, uh, then that will help. But certainly, I think there is a risk with large-scale protesting as well for increased spread. Let, let, let me ask you about that, because there has been some testing of protesters mm -hmm. after, the, after the big events in Minneapolis and New York. And at least so far, and I understand the incubation period goes on, there has not been any clear spike detected as a result of those. Uh, is it possible the public health experts are exaggerating the risk from these big public gatherings? I don't think they're exaggerating the risks. I do think, again, that it's, it's, we know from what we've seen so far in the last few months that outdoors is less of a risk than indoors and that mask use has a major impact. So to the extent that people are wearing masks in a particular gathering, that will help a lot. Um, and it is also a little bit too soon to say whether or not uh, the protests have led to increased cases, although I am very glad to see that the initial studies do show that there doesn't seem to be an increased rate of spread. It's quite different in an indoor setting where people are sitting shoulder to shoulder for a prolonged period of time and really in close quarters like that. Every time you come on, I ask you where are we with the coronavirus cases? And I want to put up a map that shows the fact that while there are significant decreases in a lot of the places that were hit uh, earliest and hardest, there are now 21 states in the West and in the South that are seeing at least a 25% increase in new cases. Dr. Inglesby, how much of that do you think is just the fact that we're testing more people? Uh, how much of that do you think is the fact that uh, maybe we're reopening too soon? And how much of that do you think is that there is, in fact, a spread, a spike in the virus in some of these states where there has been reopening? I think it's a combination of more testing and a real uh, and important spike in many cases, in many, in many states across the country. 
and you can distinguish what is what is more testing from what is more serious disease from looking at hospitalization rate, ICU rate, and the percent positivity of the overall tests in a given state. And in many states, in the ones that you just showed, particularly Arizona, Texas, the Carolinas, Florida, what we're seeing is increased positivity in testing, and in many cases, increased hospitalization, so serious illness happening. That's not just because we're doing more testing in a state. That's because there is more serious disease in a state. So that's a rise. And do you that's think some of those? In real speed. Do you think some of those states, doctors should should pull back on the reopening? Should should uh, you know if they're in phase two, go back to phase one, or even go back into partial lockdowns? I, I don't think uh, we need to go into lockdown in these places I, at this point. I think um, each state has a different story. Each state has its own reopening process, and they're all slightly different. I do think that governors should be guiding their, their public to avoid large gatherings where we see the, the, the greatest potential risk. They should also be really strongly encouraging people, leaders should be encouraging people to use the tools that we know work. We should be encouraging people to wear face coverings, to stay at a distance, to avoid large gatherings, to use hand sanitizer or wash your hands. I mean, those are the things that we know work and leaders really should, I think, double down in communicating that across the country. Those are the things that we have seen work and will work. President Trump talked uh, this week about uh, the virus, uh, the spread of the virus, and also about medical treatments. Here he is on that. We're very close to a vaccine and we're very close to therapeutics, really good therapeutics. And uh, But even without that, I don't even like to talk about that because uh, it's fading away. It's going to fade away. Is uh, the coronavirus fading away? Are we close, very close to a vaccine? And uh, the World Health Organization said this week that we are in a, let me get it right, a new and dangerous phase of COVID-19. Best case, best case, how long are we going to be living and dealing with this virus? Well, it, the first thing to say is it's not fading away. The U.S. has more cases than it's had in many, many weeks. It, uh, if you compare us to other parts of the world, our, our numbers are on the rise. The European Union, you know, we, last, last week we had 25,000 cases in a particular day, and the European Union had 4,000 cases. So it, it's not fading away in the U.S. It's not fading away in the world. There's something on the order of 70 or 80 countries where the virus is on the rise. So it's a serious, serious pandemic. And as WHO said, we are in a new phase of intensity in many parts of the world. Vaccine development is going as quickly as it's ever gone for any vaccine in the world. And there are a couple of vaccine trials that are really ramping up in the next month. So that's all good news, but we don't know yet whether and when that vaccine will work. We hope we'll have vaccine by the end of this year, but I don't think we can count on it yet. So I think people really need to focus on what they can do to decrease transmission while we wait for a vaccine and uh, continue to do the things that we know work in terms of preventing spread. Dr. Inglesby, thank you. Thanks for your time on this Father's Day. Always good to talk with you, sir.